Bibles as we begin a brand new series this morning. Uh, our series is called Cries from the Cross, and I want to ask you to turn to the 23rd chapter of Luke's Gospel. We are just going to focus on one verse this morning, verse 34. And uh, as we begin this new series, I want to let you know, last week we wrapped up a seven-week series on Titus. And today, we are going to begin a seven-part series through, the, uh, well, through different accounts of what Jesus said on the cross. Now, I want to go ahead and tell you there's a difference. When I say seven-week, that means they're consecutive. But when I say seven-part, that means that you need to be here Sundays and Wednesdays in order to get the entire series. So this morning, if you can't tell already by our incredible worship music today, we're talking about forgiveness, right? The first thing that Jesus said on the cross, the first cry. This coming Wednesday, we'll talk about the second cry where Jesus looked at one of the thieves on the cross and said, truly today you will be with me in paradise. Next Sunday, we'll look at the third cry, which is affection, right? Where Jesus spoke to his mother while being on the cross. And then... Uh, the fourth part will be the anguish, right, from Matthew 27, 46. The fifth cry is where Jesus said, I thirst, right, and John 19, 28. The sixth cry is a cry of victory, and the seventh cry is a cry of contentment. Now, my, uh, the reason God laid this on my heart, and hopefully you've already read the preaching plan and been able to see uh, where we're going in this series, but this series is aimed to prepare our hearts for Easter. We want to prepare our hearts for what God is going to do. So the seven... Uh, sermons before Easter. Now, Pastor Chris will be preaching several sermons in between there because I'll be away preaching some revivals uh, this Easter season, which I ask for your prayers for that. But I do want to give you three reasons as to why it is significant for us to stir, study the words that Jesus verbally cried out. Now, I know that doing series on the cries of Jesus on the cross is popular. A lot of you have heard sermons on this before, but I pray that you would open your heart and open your mind to hear what God might have to say with the seven last phrases that Jesus gave while he was on the cross. The last seven things that he said on the cross. Three reasons why we should do a study like this. Number one, it allows us to see Jesus's humanity. It allows us to see that while Jesus was fully God, he was still fully man, which is a sophisticated word by the name of incarnation, right? So we see his humanity. Secondly, we see his holiness. If there had been another way for Jesus to forgive us of our sins, then he would have gone another way, but there was no other way, right? The cross made the difference. The cross was the only way. The third thing is that we see Jesus' hunger. And what I mean by that, I'm not talking about Jesus' physical hunger. I'm talking about when Jesus was going through more intense physical pain than anybody here has experienced, he was thinking of us. In the first thing that Jesus said on the cross, Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. A man who was bleeding out of every possible way in his body was thinking about you. How is that not a hunger for lost souls? How is that not an example of the hunger that you and I should have, the desire that we should have, that we would not want people to die and go to hell, but we would want people to die and leave this life and go to heaven and be forgiven? So I'm going to look at Luke 23, verse 34. The first cry, the title of my sermon is the first cry, forgiveness. That's exactly what Jesus cried out. I'm going to give you the sermon in sentence. We can see a great example of the forgiveness God gives by what Jesus said on the cross when we see the possibility of forgiveness, the passiveness of far too many, and the prophecy that is fulfilled. If you have a copy of God's Word, and if you're physically able, if you would, please stand in honor of the reading of the Word of God. Most of you could probably quote this verse, but we're still going to read it. Luke 23, verse 34. And by the way, each part in this series, we'll be looking at different gospel accounts. We won't be in the same uh, gospel each week. There will be in Luke three times, we'll be in John, we'll be in Matthew, because the phrases and words of Jesus are spread out throughout the different gospel writers. 
And so that's, uh, we're thankful we have them all, but they are spread out. Okay, Luke 23, verse 34. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they cast lots to divide his garments. Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you, Lord, that we have the words of your Son, our Savior, while he was on the cross, enduring immense physical pain so that you and I might have forgiveness, so that you and I might have life. Lord, I pray for the people in this sanctuary that are not saved, that they will leave this place realizing that they are in dire need of the forgiveness that only you can give. And for those that are saved this morning, may you penetrate our hearts to realize that we need to be forgiven of sin and not let unrepentant sin rule our lives. We ask you bless this time in your word. Hide me behind your cross and forgive us where we failed you. Holy Spirit, move in this place. In Jesus' name and all God's people said... You may be seated. Now, before we guide ourselves through this text, I want to say thank you on behalf of uh, Hannah and myself for allowing us to go on a refresh retreat with other pastors across, really, the southeast. There were pastors from all kinds of states, Michigan, Mississippi, Alabama, South Carolina, Georgia. We had a wonderful time. But as God usually does, he gave me an illustration that I want to open up with. And so we had a wonderful time. It was relaxing, no phone, so that was incredible. And, and it was great, and we got to talk with couples, and, and God really laid a lot of things on my heart for the future of our church. It was wonderful. Well, we're going back, and uh, we, were, we were coming back home on Friday. We decided to come home on Friday. Uh, that's when it ended. We decided not to stay in a hotel anywhere. We missed our own bed, you know what I mean? You know you're becoming an adult where when you go somewhere else and you can't sleep because it's not your bed. Can I get an Amen. I don't care that it was the Ritz-Carlton. It wasn't my bed, right? And so I couldn't sleep, so I was ready to get home, I, you know. And, and any time you travel, you know. But I was in a good mood, you know. I was excited. I was refreshed. And my wife was in a good mood, too, and everything was going good. Well, well we leave, and, and this, this place was in the middle of nowhere, and no offense to anybody that's from South Georgia. Both my dad and my uncle were born in South Georgia, but... There's not a whole lot in South Georgia, and uh, we were in Greensboro, Georgia, and so we were leaving, and as we're leaving, there's all kind of gas stations everywhere. Well, I'm one of those guys, I get my dollar worth, you know? And uh, in my truck, you guys know I drive a 2013 Honda Ridgeline truck, and it tells me how many miles I have until I go on empty. Well, Hannah was, was doing her thing. I'm, I'm not sure what she was doing, but she was doing whatever she was doing. And I was in my head. You ever been in your head while you're driving? You're just thinking. And I, I'm thinking about all these things. And uh, not anything church-related. I was thinking about all kind of history stuff that's swirling through my head and all these different theories that I had, all got kind of weird stuff, you know, the nerdy stuff. And I looked down, and it says you have 25 miles till you're empty. I said, oh, we're good. So I didn't think about it. And, you know, normally Hannah's reminding me, she's leaning over. Y'all know that move, right? The, I mean, how many miles we got? And uh, she wasn't doing that. So I'm like, well, I'm good. You know, I'm just going to keep, I'm going to keep driving. You know, we got a good pace. We'll be home at a certain amount of time. So, so we got to keep going. Well, I looked down and I thought it was five minutes later, but it had to be longer than that. It said I had six miles to go. I said, huh. So I started looking at the signs and everything, and then, you know, I started looking at the GPS, and there's nothing, y'all. <laughs> and, 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 I, and I understand where Hannah's coming from. If, there one, if there's one thing that Hannah doesn't like, it's being unprepared. And it's running out of gas. She, she doesn't like that. <laughs> um, I grew up with a dad that ran out of gas all the time. I mean, I live by the motto, everything's going to work out. It's all going to be okay. And sometimes I'm one of those guys that just flies by the seat of my pants, right? Just kind of do what I got to do, right? And so she says, well, how many we have left? And by this time, we had three left. <laughs> and, uh, and she said, well, what are we going to do? I said, I got this. Don't you worry. I got this, right? I didn't. But I didn't tell her because if I panic, she's going to panic, right? So I'm not panicking. And uh, you guys got to remember, I don't have my phone, so I can't call Mike and get Mike to come. That's a joke. That's a joke. And so anyway, so we get off the interstate, and I see signs of this town. 
right? And so there's this town. Well, I look on Hannah's phone, and it says the only gas station in that town is closed. I said, it doesn't matter. We got to try. Well, that town was eight miles away, and I only had three. Well, I just said, you know what, Lord? I just, I just really need an extra few miles. I mean, I don't, I don't know how these ridge lines work, but just help me out. And so we keep going, we keep going, and we're in the boonies, and, and I'm, not, I'm not trying to be degrading to this town, but it didn't look like the most upper echelon town in the south. Let's just say it that way. And uh, yeah, Hannah said, where in the world are we? I said, I don't know. I got this covered, right? I said, there's a gas station, and we're going to find it. And so we roll into this town, and I, and I saw people. I said, oh, we're good. There's people. And when I... <laughs> And when I say rolled, we rolled. There was no gas left. We rolled, right? And so finally we get to this gas station, and I ran inside, and there was this person, and uh, they didn't speak great English, but that didn't matter. Uh, I said, hey, y'all got any gas? He said, what? I said, gas. You got gas? He said, I got a little bit. I said, give me whatever you got, right? And so I got enough gas to get us to the interstate, and the whole time that we were rolling down the road, my wife was giving me the look. Y'all know the look. <laughs> and the one thing I told her, I said, baby, if this works out, you got to forgive me. <laughs> but if it doesn't work out, hey, uh, you know, I'm on my own, right? And so anyway, long story short, we're back on the road. She didn't talk to me for about 30 minutes. <laughs> and so... Finally, we stopped in Augusta for lunch, and, and we're eating lunch, and she said, I forgive you, but it won't happen again. <laughs> and so I give you that illustration. Number one, fellas, don't push your luck. Number two, forgiveness is a beautiful thing, right? We were able to move on, had a great weekend, had a wonderful time, and rest and relaxation. The question we need to ask about this text is this. What does the first cry of Jesus on the cross show us about God's forgiveness? The first thing we need to see about the forgiveness of God that Jesus shows by verbally saying these words is there is a possibility of forgiveness. The possibility of forgiveness. Look at that phrase, and Jesus said, Father, forgive them. In my opinion, these are some of the strongest and life-altering words that Jesus spoke in his time on earth. Forgiveness is so hard for many people gathered here today. Many people are okay with being forgiven, but not many people are okay with forgiving, right? And I want to remind you what Jesus said in the New Testament is that we have to be able to forgive in order for him to forgive us, right? And so the next time you struggle with forgiveness, I want you to think of the words that Jesus said to his father. Maybe you haven't struggled with forgiveness before, but maybe you've struggled with wondering if God really does love you. Does God really care about me? One commentator said, in the middle of his torment, the Son of God prays for sinners. In verse 34, he says that forgiveness is Possible. Forgiveness is possible only because of what Jesus did. Have you accepted this possibility and made forgiveness a reality in your life? There's two things we need to see about the possibility of forgiveness. Number one, the example in prayer. Jesus sets a really good example of how we should pray. Notice how Jesus opens up his prayer. He says, Father. Now, during Jesus' ministry on earth, he gave a lot of great examples of how we should live and act. And many times, Jesus gave an example on how we should pray. Do you remember when Jesus was instructing the people in Matthew chapter 6, verse 9, where you see the Lord's Prayer? How did he open it up in Matthew 6, 9? Father, right? He said, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, or hallowed be thy name, depending on the translation in Matthew 26, 39. And going a little farther, he fell on his face. This is talking about Jesus. And prayed, saying, My my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass for me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. By referring to God as Father, Jesus is affirming the Trinity and is affirming his relationship with the Father. Remember, God is the one who told him that he had to go through with this. So many of us would abandon God. Most of us would abandon God if God made us go through what Jesus went through. John Green said, in his mind, his horrible and humiliating condition in no way jeopardizes his relationship 
with God. I believe he also says, Father, so that those around the cross who were listening would know that he had not abandoned God. If Jesus had abandoned God, he wouldn't refer to him as Father. When you say Father, there's a, there's a sense of affection. There's a sense of love. And I've always said that if you call someone Father, that's not something that's given. That's something that's earned, right? And so Jesus is calling his Father Father. I believe Jesus gives us really two really good examples of how we should take this word Father. That simple word Father should be a great example in our prayer life. Number one, we should address God as our Father. Now, here's something, and I've told you this before, but we've got so many new folks, I'm just going to say it again. I can't stand to hear people say, Big man upstairs. That is not our God, okay? So we need to be careful how we address God in prayer. We need to be careful the words that we use. There are some churches, and I'm not making fun, but there are some modern churches, uh, larger churches that will use the phrase, uh, and I don't even like to use this phrase. I absolutely hate it. But they, in praying, they will say, Daddy God. Okay, that's not good either. So when we talk to the Lord, we should have reverence of his name. We should call him by his name. When we address God as Father or Lord, we are showing that he is Lord, that he is creator, that he is sustainer, and that he is redeemer. Now, the Greek word that Jesus, is, Jesus used for Father is very common. It's found 413 times in the New Testament. The Greek word is potter. P-A-T-E-R, pater. And so it is the word that is used for father. Now, it father occurs 900, the English word father occurs 979 times in the English translations. 42% of the 979 times the Greek word potter is used. And it literally means God in the context of father, man, and obviously Lord Jesus. Right, And so he's particular in his use of words. Number two, not only should we uh, address God as our Father and address God respectfully and address God reverently. Secondly, we should pray in the darkest of times. Sometimes when you're in the darkest of times, you want to do everything but talk to God, right? You, you think God put this on you. You think this is God's fault. But look, Jesus is on the cross in agony and pain. He has blood spilling out everywhere. He's naked. Everybody can see him. And he's praying. When things go wrong, do you run away from God or run to God in prayer? Now, prayer's not the only time we should talk to God, but your prayer life will be a lot stronger if you talk to God in peace times. It'll be so much stronger when you have adversity instead of only talking to God when you have adversity. That follows the genie concept, right? The one thing that Satan does not want you to do when you face hard times is Satan does not want you to pray. But Jesus gives a great example here by saying, Father. Just simply Father gives us a great example in prayer. The second thing, not only do you see the example of prayer that Jesus gives, I think you see the essence of pardon. Look at the word forgiven. The word pardon is defined as the action of forgiving or being forgiven for an error or offense. Jesus paid a debt that you and I could not pay. And he paid a debt that he didn't know. Jesus didn't know that debt, but he took it on for you and for I. I'm so reminded of, of Romans 5, 8. But God shows his love for us. And that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You say, Pastor, I hear that verse all the time. Do you really know what it means? But God shows his love for us. That while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Romans 3, 23 says, for all have sinned. And fall short of the glory of God. The word forgive here is the Greek word aphemai. And aphemai literally means to send away or dismiss. And it occurs 143 times. Now how powerful is that? If aphemai means to send away or to dismiss, how powerful is it that God has dismissed our sin so that you and I can live freely and fully and live forgiven lives? It's been dismissed. You don't have to worry about it anymore. Jesus' life and ministry on earth embodied forgiveness. I want you to remember, though, that Jesus lived out what Jesus taught. 
In Luke chapter 6, verses 35 through 36, Jesus taught about this very thing that he lives out here. But love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return. And your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High, for He is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. Be merciful, even as your Father is merciful. Also, when Jesus said on the cross, Ephemi, He also fulfilled Isaiah 53, verse 12. Therefore, I will divide Him a portion with the many, and He shall divide the spoil with the strong, because He poured out His soul to death, and was numbered with the transgressors, yet he bore the sins of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. So what you need to understand is that prayer can also be another word for intercession, right? And Jesus is interceding on behalf of the very ones that he was dying for. So when Jesus says, forgive them, he fulfills Isaiah 53, 12 and takes away our sin. Before we can move on from the possibility, we must clarify a misconception that is brought up concerning this passage. Not all people are forgiven just because Jesus prayed that. Okay? Jesus prayed that, but that doesn't take the free will out of the equation. That doesn't take the fact that you and I actually have to accept it. Warren Wearsby said, we must not infer from his prayer that ignorance is a basis for forgiveness or that those who sinned against Jesus were automatically forgiven because he prayed. Jesus prays this prayer showing us that we have the possibility, but you and I have to make the decision. Right? This prayer means the gates are wide open. You can be forgiven if you accept it, but you have to make that decision. Look at Luke 5.32. Great example of this. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. I'm a full believer that salvation is by grace through faith, but in order to have faith by grace, you're going to show repentance. You're going to show a change. There's going to be something different. Before we look at the second point this morning, since this is a Baptist church, even though all those preachers at that thing, they say, well, you're not Baptist. I look at them like, what are you talking about? I am Baptist. They said, no, you're Baptist costal. I don't know about all that. I don't get into that. But here's the problem about the possibility of forgiveness. Many people want Jesus to forgive them. But you won't forgive that person in your Sunday school class. You won't forgive that person that's sitting all the way across from you in a sanctuary that said something to you 35 years ago. You won't forgive that family member that made a remark at a a family reunion 50 years ago. If you're going to accept the forgiveness of Jesus, don't you think you should embody the forgiveness of Jesus? If the possibility, if you've accepted the possibility, then you have the utmost potential to forgive everybody that has wronged you. Okay, first thing, the possibility of forgiveness. Second thing, the passiveness of far too many. Look in the middle of verse 34. This is, so Jesus starts out by saying, Father, forgive them. And then he says this, for they know not what they do. Too many people live life as if there is no expiration date and as if there is no eternity after this life. Let me share with you two truths. You will die. Unless you're caught up in the rapture, you will die. Secondly, you will spend eternity somewhere, holy or hot, but you get to choose. So you're going to die, but you get to choose where you spend. Just like the people of Jesus' day, the them there in verse 34 that is referred to in this verse, they were passive when it came to Jesus. As a matter of fact, the fact that all of this came to a head and he was crucified, Jesus was crucified by the same people that one week earlier on Palm Sunday cried, Hosanna, Hosanna, right? Glory to God in the highest, Hosanna, Hosanna. It shows they were more passive and really in all reality, they were passive aggressive towards Jesus because one week they're smiling to his face with palm branches and then the next week they're crying crucify him boy they'd they'd make good southern Baptists wouldn't they we'll smile at you one week and we'll leave church and and uh, and I heard this phrase at the conference uh, so I can't take uh, credit for it but some of you are going to leave today and you're going to have fried preacher for lunch I never heard that till this past week. I said, man, I've had fried preacher before, and you have too. 
right? I mean, you go home and you're eating at the table or, or if you go out to eat or whatever the case is and you say, man, I didn't like what he wore today or I didn't like what he said or, you know, all that kind of stuff. But we don't need to be passive aggressive. Not just with others, but especially not with Jesus. And in a similar way, many of the people who are gathered here today, you might not be passive aggressive, but you're passive when it comes to Christ. I mean, you're passive when it comes to missions. You're pass passive when it comes to giving. But boy, you're passionate when we have a meal. I got to eat. Nobody said amen there. I noticed that. <laughs> We're passionate sometimes about the wrong things. Sometimes our passiveness causes souls to go to hell because we're not passionate enough to tell them. If you're passive when it comes to Jesus, I believe he calls you out. If you're passive when it comes to your relationship with Jesus, that them there in verse 34, that's calling you and I out. Okay, now I know it's talking about the Romans. I know it's talking about the Jews. I know all that theologically. But you've got to understand, we're grouped in that category too if we take Jesus passively. You remember back in the day when teachers used to write on your report card? There's one thing my teachers never wrote on my report card. Too passive. But you know what they did write? Too much energy, right? Can't, can't handle, right? Too passionate, too over the top. I want to show you two ways I believe we see passiveness of far too many. Number one, you see two groups. Look at the word they in your text in verse 34. In the immediate context of what Jesus was experiencing, he was referring to both Jews and Romans. Now, Jews and Romans aligned together in opposition of Jesus, right? They hated him. The Romans didn't like Jesus because of the uproar they felt he created within the Jewish community. The Romans also didn't like Jesus because they felt that because he called himself a king. And they mocked him for that. They didn't like that. They thought there was only Caesar, right? There is no other king. And so they hated Jesus for those two reasons. But the Jews were plotting against Jesus for a long, long time. They were the religious Pharisees and the Sadducees. So even with all this hate that had been built up by these two groups of people, he still asked the Father to forgive them. Commentator Thomas Schreiner said, Hatred, revenge, and bitterness do not lodge in Jesus' heart toward the full of, of, toward, towards those full of rage against him. I want to ask you, how do you respond to the groups or people in your life that have rage against you? Do you ask God to help you forgive them? Because I know some of you have been through some trials and tribulations that are hard. You've been wronged. You've had some bad things happen to you. But can I encourage you not to harbor that ill will towards them? Ask God to forgive you of that. The other thing that we see, not only do you see two groups, you also see the truth is generated. Look at that phrase there in verse 34. Know not what they do. Until you and I come to a believing relationship with Jesus, we do not fully realize the magnitude of our sin. Now, I love that our church is involved in the Good News Club. Here's one thing that, that blows my mind. Uh, not really blows my mind, but it's interesting. Uh, and I think a lot of people reflect this. When you, when you have the Good News Club, we have our time, and then you have an invitation time, right? And, man, if one comes, they all come in, right? I mean, they, they all want to come. So you have to cipher out which ones are serious, which ones are not. And so the main thing, when I sit down with a child, the number one thing I ask them, I ask an adult this too, what is sin and do you do it? Nine times out of ten, people can tell you what sin is, right? Most of the time, not all the time. But then the second question is where they usually don't understand this. Earlier this week, a little girl told me, I've sinned one time. <laughs> I said, okay, I don't think you have a full understanding yet. We're going to keep working with you. We're going to keep teaching you. But that magnitude, the understanding, because when you understand the weight of your sin and the magnitude that it puts on your shoulders of a weight that you can't bear and a price that you can't pay, the only thing you can do is cry out to Jesus and say, Father, forgive me. I can't deal with this sin. I can't. I can't pay this. 
I'm imperfect, I'm unholy, but you are righteous, you are holy. Don't you see that Jesus' death was providing for the very basis on which those who were crucifying him could one day be forgiven if they choose to accept it? Don't you remember after the Roman soldier struck Jesus in the side? He's like, oh my goodness, what did I do? Truly, this was the Son of God. One commentator said, ignorance does not ex excuse the evil done, but the ignorant are given an opportunity to turn away from their wickedness. For those who are here today, you might not realize the magnitude of your sin. You might not realize it, but your sin is what put Jesus on the cross. When, when Brother Lee sang just a minute ago, he said the, the nail was in his hand. And he's right. Because our sin put Jesus on the cross. Now, the phrase, and by the way, if you walked in today and you said, I don't know what I do, now you do. You sin, okay? Now, for New Testament Christians in the New Testament church, this phrase, Father, forgive them, know not what they do, became what we would probably call, you guys remember the Alamo, right? And people would always say, remember the Alamo, remember those that died fighting for the Alamo. I've been there several times, wonderful place. Well, this phrase, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do, is, is similar to that in the sense that Stephen cried this out as he was being stoned in Acts chapter 7, verse 60. And falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. So the truth of the gospel can be generated in your own heart this morning when you realize that you're a sinner and that you're in need of a Savior. Our sin put Jesus on the cross. Now, a lot of people here are saved. Here's the deal. You still don't realize the magnitude of your sin because you still keep doing the same thing. You still keep gossiping, right? You still keep idols. You still keep church as an option and not as a responsibility. All these different things. This morning, we've seen the first cry of Jesus. Can you believe we've already gotten that much out of those few words? That's how deep Jesus is, right? So we've looked at the first cry of forgiveness. We see the possibility of forgiveness, the passiveness of far too many. Now we need to look at the last phrase in verse 34 as we look at how the prophecy was fulfilled. Look at verse 34. And they cast lots to divide his garments. Now, this portion of the verse is not the words of Jesus on the cross, but they do give us a little bit of context. We see that Luke gives a little bit of added commentary to what Jesus said. The reason he does this is because this is fulfilled in Scripture. Not only does Jesus fulfill his own teachings in Luke's chapter, Luke chapter 6, verses 35 through 36, it was also fulfilled in what Jesus said from Isaiah 53, verse 12. The other thing that is fulfilled, and we looked at this during our Christmas sermon series, the phrase, and they cast lots to divide his garments, fulfills Psalms 22, 18. Right? And so, and I'll read that for you. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Now, we had a whole sermon on that back in December, so I'm not going to go crazy in depth on that. If you remember, on Christmas Eve, we had a whole message, a whole drama skit about this entire passage. Right? But it is a fulfillment of Psalms 22. Now, Joe B. Green made a great comment concerning this verse. The reality that Jesus' abominable fate is neither a surprise to God nor a contradiction of the divine purpose. Two things you need to see about how this prophecy is fulfilled. I think you need to see the shame that was shown. They had no mercy on him. The mercy that he was wanting to give them by saying, Father, forgive them. They didn't show that to him on the cross. They didn't show that in the way that they executed and constantly beat him. Now, it was quite normal in Roman culture for those that were doing the killing. It's almost like a tip for a, a waiter or a waitress working in a restaurant. Part of, of, of the benefits of this job of, of being someone that crucified people was you got to take their possessions. You got to take what they left behind. And obviously all Jesus has, we, what we believe, is some kind of robe, right? And now you always see that they're white. We don't necessarily know that it was or not. But in Jesus' day as it is today, to strip somebody of clothing is a symbol of indignity and also the loss of somebody's personal identity, right? 
It's not a good thing. The way that Luke includes this detail, I tend to think these actions happen right in front of Jesus. The way that Luke phrases this in the Greek text, I believe Jesus physically saw them gamble for his clothes. The shame was shown, but I also want you to see that the solitude was symbolized. Jesus could have gotten off the cross if he wanted to. Jesus could have had one of those moments that you and I have had before. Well, I'm going to show them. You ever have one of those? Next time you want to have one of those, I want you to think about what Jesus did and what Jesus symbolized. The question was asked by one of the three thieves on the cross. We'll look at this Wednesday night. I encourage you to be here. One of the thieves on the cross said, One of the criminals who were hanged railed at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. That same question has been asked in a different way by people in our world today. The answer is simple. Jesus could have gotten off the cross, but love for you and I is what kept him on the cross. So that you and I could be forgiven of our sins. Notice that we don't see Jesus lash out in any anger or rage on the cross. Instead, we see his passion and his love for those that he was coming to save. Oh, what beauty that is symbolized in the solitude that Jesus showed and expressed until his mission was complete. He showed solitude till the very end. He showed self-control till the very end. Jesus cried out to God in his darkest hour, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. I know there are people here this morning that might be considered them, right? The them in verse 4. I know there are people here today that might be living in sin and running from God. Maybe you have a personal relationship, but you're living in sin. You need to come down. You don't need to confess to me. You have the priesthood of every believer. You need to come down here. You need to confess to God yourself or where you are, right where you are. Forgiveness is, from God is a truly incredible thing. But it's not enough just to know. We actually have to believe. I want to encourage you before you leave today, do not be one of the far too many. You remember that? Don't be one of the far too many that says, well, I'll just wait. Don't wait. Number one, nobody knows the day or the hour of Christ's return. But number two, you don't know when you're going to die. The I don't care attitude sends more and more people to hell every single day. The I'll get right with God when I'm old attitude sends people to hell every day. The I'm going to accept Christ on my deathbed. You don't know if you're going to have a bed to die on. You might die in a car. You might die anywhere, right? The prophecies of Jesus' first coming were all true, and they were all fulfilled. So why do we not think the prophecies of the second coming will also be fulfilled? If we see forgiveness this morning, I want you to see the possibility of forgiveness, the passiveness of far too many, and I want you to see the prophecy fulfilled. Alan, if you could go ahead and cut the live stream. I want to close this morning. We're going to have a time of invitation. I want to invite you to come. I want to invite you to join us, but I also want...